Good morning, everyone. Still morning, right? Uh, welcome to the Distinguished Lecture Series on Information Technology and Society. This is a lecture series sponsored by the Donald Brent School of Information and Computer Sciences. Uh, it brings to our school and our campus, for that matter, uh, a speaker whose work on information technology over the years has had a profound impact on our society. This is the first lecture for this year. We have another one coming up in uh, early spring. And we're very uh, honored and fortunate to have with us today uh, Dr. Alfred Spector, who's going to talk to us about opportunities and perils of data science, which I think is something that we all care very, very deeply about. Let me tell you a few things about uh, Alfred, even though he doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, uh, Alfred is Chief Technology Officer at Two Sigma, a firm dedicated to using information to undertake many forms of economic optimization, so it's not only fintech. Uh, I think it's fair to say that first and foremost, Al uh, Alfred is an academic. He started his career at Carnegie Mellon University a few decades ago. Then he became an entrepreneur. He started Transarc uh, at Pittsburgh. Uh, Transarc commercialized the Andrew file system, which uh, later became known as uh, OpenAFS. It was acquired by uh, IBM in 1994. And then Alfred moved to the corporate research side. He was heading IBM research for a number of years, and he moved on to, to direct Google research. And uh, I believe you joined Two Sigma back in 2014. 15. 15, four or five years ago. Uh, Alfred has uh, lectured widely on the growing importance of computer science across all disciplines, which again is one of the things that we uh, are very much sensitized to. Uh, he received his uh, A.B. degree, Bachelor's of Art degree in Applied Mathematics from Harvard, a PhD in Computer Science from Stanford, and, and back then there was only 200 PhDs that were coming out uh, the PhD pipeline, a uh, very, very different world. Uh, he was a Hertz Fellow while at Stanford. He's a Fellow of the ACM and IEEE, a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And I see Alfred coming close too to much, me. Too much. Too much. <laughs> Without further ado, okay. let, let's, let's welcome Dr. Alfred. It's really great to be here. If I could just call out uh, one of my fellow 200 PhDs graduating in 1981 is Rich Pattis who is on your esteemed faculty is probably one of the most beloved teachers, I would guess, that UC Irvine has ever had. <laughs> like that, is that what you're saying? Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, Rich taught me a lot in graduate school. We, had, we shared an office uh, for a couple of years, uh, and it was really uh, terrific, and I'm so glad to see him today. Well, look, this is a, um, a really complicated talk to give, because I could talk about this for about eight hours. And I've written a lot about this. I'm in the process of writing a few papers on it. But I will try to get together a lot of material. The goal of this talk is to try to integrate this conundrum that on the one hand, data science is amazing. Uh, it's amazing in its impact so far. And it's amazing in its potential. On the other hand, it's sort of very problematic. It has many, many challenges associated with it. And I'd like to cover. Uh, I'd like to cover them. So first is I have a, a definition, which I'd like to give you, because I think it's always useful to define things. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I saw things occurring, particularly when I was at Google. And then after I left Google, I had seven months of sort of sabbatical. That's, I guess, why seven, sabbatical, et cetera, seven months, and before I took another job. And in that, I devoted a lot of effort to actually when I put together the bulk of this talk for an informs uh, keynote that I gave back in um, uh, 2014, or maybe 15, I guess maybe 2015, when it became clear to me that we were sort of marching in one direction and there were going to be lots of reverberations if we didn't think about what we were doing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the uh, issues and how it might affect the university, and then more sort of mitigations and a roadmap of some research areas and things that I think we need to do. And I'll finish by just putting in a plug for a programming challenge that my, uh, that my firm uh, sponsors now jointly with Kaggle coming up that I think some of you might find uh, very interesting to go do. 
All right, so quickly, uh, data science is this very broad topic now. It's a transdisciplinary effort. We have to unite and think about many things at the same time. That's the word trans in this instance here. Certainly involving computer science and statistics, applied mathematics, say operations research and the like. Oh, people that are taking pictures of slides, almost all of these slides are available on my website. You can save all of the storage costs of duplicating <laughs> material over and over again. And I think it's being videoed or not. It's being videoed as well. Uh, and there is a transcript of most of this talk on my website that's, uh, it's not exactly light reading, but there are not ums and ahs in it. It's been edited to be readable. Okay. So, uh, so with that, and I'll give you the, the link at the end of the talk if you stay long enough, if you don't like pass out from boredom or something. So uh, it, it clearly involves all these sort of mathematical and scientific things, but I think it involves the humanities and social sciences. Because you can't actually think about what the optimization criteria are for some problem domain without actually thinking about philosophy or political science or economics. So we have to work together on this. And it's, it's really interesting. It's not just computational. Even in the realm of commerce, you can't actually produce a product which is data science oriented without actually thinking about how do I capture data? How will people react to that, the human factors of this? Uh, looking at two experts in this space, are really critical uh, in this domain. So you have to think about the human aspects of this as well as the computational. So you're thinking not only about machine learning or regression or something, but how do you set up the system, capture, store, and do all the things we might do to use data. What are we doing? We're trying to do prediction, optimization, and understanding. Understanding what I mean is we use all this data to try to help us get to causation, right? It isn't causation, right? It's correlation, where you're really finding. But we're trying to understand maybe disease and the causal pathways between some pathogen and, uh, and, uh, and some result in a human or animal. Scale is very large. It's really quite amazing. When I started talking about this, people hadn't really gathered the size of, this, of these things. But they, they really are huge. Um, even at Two Sigma, at my firm, we now uh, are storing um, in excess of 10 to the 15th bytes of data per month. To put that in perspective, when I joined Google in around 7, 2007, I think we only had 10 to the 18th bytes of data, plus or minus. So we're, even a small investment firm is doing 0.1% of Google storage per month. Now, I, admittedly, it's a decade later. Uh, so these are really big things. And the terms that also go along with this are big data, which is really about the engineering of the storage and use of, of data, and then machine learning, which is the preeminent sort of new kid on the block in terms of making sense of it. It's really no different than, say, regression, but just a lot more sophisticated and complicated and to some degree less well understood. Um, uh, it, it's interesting to um, I'm going to get back to that in a moment. So I'll go back to Alan Turing. That slide's actually out of order, I regret. Um, things are big. Um, if you go see a data center, who's been inside of a data center? Uh, a few of us have. They, they sort of look like this without the mood lighting. So they really are big computers. And they, they all look like the same thing. So they're very big. Um, it's had a huge effect on computer science, this empiricism. So it's interesting to note that if you go back in time, Empiricism really was not a part of computing for all practical purposes. There was mathematical analysis, right? People were looking for algorithms. They were looking at computability theory and such things. And we we're certainly doing engineering, right? We we're certainly saying, well, I could build an adder. And I could combine adders together and build a multiplication unit, shift, and like, starting with little bits and going all the way up. But empiricism was relatively small. And it began to change. And it changed in a variety of areas. Um, it certainly changed as we had more and more data, right? That's certainly something that happened. Where did we see its impact? Well, we began to see it hugely as we started to develop user interfaces, right, that were cool. We started to actually say, can we measure, can we develop hypotheses and then measure and test those hypotheses to see if we understand how to make systems that people can actually use without, you know, studying for a year before they use them are reading manuals that are that thick, which is what it used to be. Everyone used to know when an IBM mainframe came, it would come with a truckload of manuals. And that's how well the HCI people have done the, 
They don't have to do that when you buy a new cell phone, which is, of course, much more complex than a mainframe as well. So we've got to empiricism, but it's the new kid on the block. And so this field, in about the last, really since about 1990, 1995, has developed this empirical part of it, which is what's fueled data science, I think. Now, the statisticians have done their role as well. Coming out of the computer science side, I tend to think more in terms of the impact of all the computing on it. But we can debate where the, where the, the history is. Um, we see these things everywhere at scale. So all of you probably know, unless you're just like, you know, not been paying too much attention, that you see it in, in pretty much every website and almost everything going on. Everyone is trying to capture data as the systems operate with the goal of making them systems work better and better. When I was at Google, and it's still true in many places that I see, if we actually replaced a heuristic that existed with a machine learning algorithm, the system would get 10% better, no matter what machine learning algorithm we used. It was not really that important. You could get a little better if you used a better machine learning algorithm or not. And indeed, as, as we got to deep networks, they got considerably better. But, but you just like automatically did things better. The clearest example of use um, was spelling correction. So how many people know how spelling correction works? Um, does Google or Bing and Microsoft do they actually hire linguists in every language that are monitoring the newspapers for new words that are entering the vocabulary and madly typing them in? And the answer is no. There are essentially no people, you know, the tiny, tiny teams that do the spelling correction systems in these systems. And that's because they mine the errors that people are making as well as the characteristics of the corpus of what people actually are typing into. And between the corpus, which is used to look at likely spellings, and the interaction log, which shows people, say, typing something like Barack, B-A-R-A-Q-U-E, perhaps, the first time they saw it, and then uh, seeing no search results, and then very quickly typing it again with a CK on it, uh, and they found that they got search results, very rapidly systems just learn to spell. And it's quite remarkable. There are a variety of algorithms that work at scale. And it has essentially no downsides. It's not gamed. There are no people from foreign powers trying to mess up the spelling <laughs> of the World Wide Web. So it's sort of the perfect example. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. There are a few people that could say, well, maybe these spelling correctors are making us dumb. Right? I don't think that's true, but it is actually a, a, it's a reasonable cocktail party debate. Are people, are, you, you actually, there's someone, someone does educational statistics in the room, I was just talking with her. Be interesting to see if people actually spell better because of the corrected spelling or spell worse. I don't know if that study's been done, but it would be a good one to go do. So the architectures of these systems, I'm a systems guy, really by training, is users talk with some web server somewhere, the web server consults a machine learning model, which tells it, hey, I should correct this error into the following thing, or I should recommend this kind of a movie, or whatever it might be. Everything that's typed, whether by the system or the user, gets stored in these very long append-only sequences of information, and that gets joined with perhaps data from the real world, um, maybe the weather, who knows what else it may be, vast amounts of other information. That is used periodically during a retraining step for the machine learning model, and a virtuous circle is hopefully created. That's the goal of this. Let's talk about that virtuous circle as to whether it's completely virtuous. But indeed, the system gets better and better because the more data, the more usage, the better the model, the more usage, the better the model, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can't forget this. These systems, and in fact, it's very easy to forget it, Many of you may be undergraduates thinking, well, you can go do a startup tomorrow and go make something really great. Well, if you don't have very careful analysis tools and you're not monitoring the details of what is going on, your system will diverge from what it's supposed to be doing and you'll get in trouble. And if there's any example you'd like of that, you could look at the, uh, the chat bot that Microsoft uh, released a few years back that learned hate speech very rapidly. <laughs> uh, it was not good for Microsoft's reputation. Here's an example. 
Um, users um, would like music recommendations. The, the disadvantage now to having everything ever written, essentially, available in a single library is unlike, you know, in the old days we would have records that were about this wide if we were, you know, reasonably, if we had summer jobs we could have these many records. Right, and you, could, you knew where they were. They were in alphabetic order. Here was my jazz, here was my rock and roll, here was my classical music, show music. I had them organized. About that many, right? Makes sense? And you could find them. Now you can't, so you need a recommendation system to find stuff. So collaborative filtering is the technology heavily used by Amazon and Netflix and music recommendation systems to, the, using machine learning algorithms to say, if you like Mozart, and other people who like Mozart also like early Beethoven, you will also like early Beethoven. All right, and that's quite true, right? Because that, that picked up on the fact that both of these uh, composers uh, overlapped, at least in the early part of Beethoven's life and the later part of Mozart's. So that's one technique. A second technique are, what if we knew about the connections of all musicians? And we understood uh, that um, the Beatles had Ringo Starr in it and John Lennon, then you'd know that if you liked the Beatles, you knew that you could like Ringo Starr. So that either could be hand done in an encyc from encyclopedias, or it could be mined using natural language processing techniques and perhaps other ways of building that ontology of information. Music recommendation systems today have that. And finally, you could do audio signal processing. Right? You could actually look at the actual uh, vibrations uh, as represented in the waveforms and the timbre, and maybe the beat, rhythms, etc., and actually decide on what would make sense. And maybe there are things that are compatible for a while, and then all of us get bored, then we need something different, and systems could learn to go do that. And the ensemble of those three things is what would make a music recommendation system that could be actually far better than a human. What human could possibly know the entire ontology of all music? Even, and no, no musicologist even, even here at a great music school could do that. So it's very interesting. Um, clearly a good idea. This is a very good example of how these systems work. By the way, it's not dissimilar to finance. So uh, there's a reason why sort of a quasi-academic like myself could go be the CTO of about 800 people at an investment firm, a big part of which is a hedge fund. If you think about looking for predictive predictions on stock prices, some of the predictions might be based on what are other people thinking? If everybody is assuming there's going to be a crisis relating to public health, then whether or not there will be a crisis relating to public health could drive panic and lower prices. That's kind of a collaborative filtering analog. Um, if you knew, on the other hand, that because of a public health crisis, people were using the web more to buy things, and you could detect that fundamental relationship between web browsing and revenue of a web company, you could say, well, differentially, people will like web-based purchasing and dislike mall-based purchasing and make decisions there. That's kind of a fundamental analysis notion, like what in the knowledge and connection domain. And then many people believe you can look at all of the stock price ticks, the six billion or something stock price ticks in a day, and determine a lot about what's going on inside the mind of investors that's referred to as technical analysis. And if you looked at what our firm does, we use an, a large number of predictive algorithms in an ensemble that go and make decisions on what should be in a portfolio of, say, a university endowment or something that we support. So it's a very similar kind of thing. So the areas of applicability are like endless, right? This, I mean, if you, if you set me down and gave me eight slides today, I think, Within an hour and a half, I would add you know, another seven slides to this of where the areas are. So uh, the number of machine learning courses and introductory statistics with a machine learning bet, it's huge here. The desire to learn this is huge. It's correct. Right? There's no doubt it's extremely valuable. Um, Mike Carey and I are on the Touring Award Committee of the ACM. It's the reason I was here. Um, we gave out the Turing Award right, to Bengio and Lacoon and Hinton last year because they catalyzed this more than anyone else. And I think that's valid. We made the right decision, and I think it's true. All right, so what, how do we look at what's good here? So the characteristic of success is um, spelling was a really good example. There, there's some things to learn about it. One is 
there was a fairly simple database to go help you figure this out, and that's the log of everybody's typing and whether they had a long click or short click. Did they get a result or not? Did, did something that they put in actually match what they wanted? That's a long click. They saw something, they saw Barack Obama, and they clicked on it and they learned he was a senator from Illinois or whatever. Um, is there a clear objective function? Do we actually know what we want? That's a big problem, right, in a lot of things. But here we do. Is there a low cost of error? What if you make a mistake? Does someone die? No, right? You have a misspelling, like I put here cleverly. Uh, if you have, does it have to be transparently reproducible? Is it likely that a company is going to get subpoenaed for all the data that's used in spelling correction and told, prove to us you've done this the right way? That would be true of a scientific result on cancer. Right? You'd have to have reproducibility of the data saying, this is why we believe this chemical is carcinogenic. Not true with this, right? This, this log can be kept private. It's not going to be subpoenaed, I, at least I hope. Um, and it doesn't need to be shown. The number of signals is not that large. The, you don't have to look at hundreds of words to figure out what's going on. It's a tractable problem. And you know what? No one cares about why. Right? You don't care. You're not saying to the system, why did you change the spelling from you know, an S to a Z in English, from you know, a British spelling to an American spelling? You, don't, you might know why, but you don't care. The system might, your fingers might be over one on the keyboard to the left, and you've typed every character wrong. Spelling correctors will correct that a lot of the time. You don't, it doesn't even know why. It just doesn't. You don't care. We do care why uh, in, say, understanding there's a correlation between poverty and life expectancy, uh, the poverty inverse, cor inverse relationship, there we really do care about why. Just showing that statistic, it makes for presidential debates that are frankly annoying, um, but it doesn't shed any light on the real problem. So what are the challenges? So <clears throat> it's really interesting, I think, to try to produce a, a structure like this. Um, where can things work? So if you only need correlations and you have a clear objective function, you can build a system fairly clear, fairly easily. Um, it's sort of clear what to do. So speech recognition is another example, right? When someone says something, it's, it, there is actually clarity in what you want. You don't need, and you're not looking for causation. You're just trying to map these things together. If the correlations are sufficient, but it's not so forgiving, then you have medical diagnosis is kind of an example. You might not need to know why, but if you make a mistake, it's pretty expensive. So you don't like that. And then, so for example, if you look at what was done recently, I think Google published some results on using multispectral imaging to look for breast cancer. It's, it's, it's good work. Right? It seems to be pretty good work. They're not the only ones to have done it. Um, but it would be very fine for to have very low cost screening so that we could protect women and do it very cheaply and easily, uh, exactly why you don't necessarily need to know. That can be found out later, what, what it was in the imagery that caused the issue. And then if you need causality, um, then, then that's much harder, right? It's, it's much, much harder because just making lots of observations without the ability to perturb the system and see the impact of the perturbation on the results is hard to go do. And then if you have a contentious <laughs> objective functions, it's really complicated, right? And can you, can you agree? Do you agree with Facebook's objective functions and recommendation systems, right? That's a really complicated problem that's at the root of Facebook's problems to a large degree today is Washington is saying maybe, uh, they're, they're at least intimating, don't publish stuff which is disruptive. And Facebook is saying, well, what do you mean by that? Right? And so the objective is, is not exactly clear. I presume Democrats think Republican stuff is disruptive and vice versa, and may, maybe we could all agree on a few things, but it's not clear, and that's why there's been freedom of speech. So this notion of objective function has to be kept in mind, that it's a very serious issue. Even global warming, it seems like inconceivable in a wealthy land like ours that this is not deemed universally as a big problem. But if you were hungry, and you didn't have enough food, you wouldn't worry about what two generations down the road is going to think about. So as you look at, if you look at, say, CO2 emissions over the last 15, 20 years, 
the CO2 emissions in the United States and Western Europe are essentially flat. And the CO2 emissions in India and China are way up. And they're very likely to go up for a very long time for many reasons, one of which is it's just not exactly the priority there. So very interesting sets of issues in that. So what I do is I boil this down into 11 challenges, which is a big number. It probably should be three categories and three per category, but I didn't do a good enough job. But I'd be very interested in your thinking. It's, this is now a number of years after I first did this. And I wish I had another seven months to go do it again, because I, maybe I would do it better. So I'll try to finish a few minutes early. So uh, these are the ones. I won't list them now. I'll go through them, and then we'll discuss them. So first is, uh, clearly, privacy is an issue. And by privacy, what I mean is the divulging of your personal data to people that should not know that data. Right? Uh, that, that ha so for example, when Facebook gave Cambridge Analytica data, uh, supposedly under non-disclosure, they signed an agreement with the guy, uh, that was an error. Right? That, was a, that was a privacy violation that Facebook made. All right. Um, I, I think we should, frankly, as a society, conclude privacy as a topic means the divulging of data. It's not, is someone getting rich with my data? It's not, is my data being used to manipulate me? There may be no divulging of data in that case. We'll get to those issues. Those are issues later. Security is another example. That's another problem. Even if we build systems that are not intended to distribute data. I, has any of you ever had your Google password guess? Happens frequently because people use terrible passwords. Your search log would be available to people. So people could see everything you searched on. You might think of that as a privacy violation, but it's really a security problem. Your password was guessed. There are a lot of security risks. The one that's unusual here that you may not think about is resilience. So we, in this room, I suspect, are all in favor of building more and more creative and valuable systems to make the world a better place. All those systems have a certain amount of, um, uh, of um, uh, challenges for them to keep working well. And given that they are usually optimizing resources, if the optimization goes wrong, will run out of a resource very easily. So um, the, an example is, let's say that we're using uh, Google or Apple Maps to optimize uh, traffic flows on all of the highway infrastructure here. The former research lead at Google, I, would say, what a great thing. We're getting more utilization of these very expensive road networks. Well, the answer is we, we're running them at ever higher total capacity. And if anything ever goes wrong, we'll have the, the traffic jam to end all traffic jams. Because <laughs> you're running with no headroom anymore. So the brittleness of systems can be exposed through significant optimization. And that's an issue that I think we have yet to begin to deal with. It's also the case that we sometimes <coughs> want to build very integrated systems that can optimize very broadly. And those are monocultures which can admit to a single point of failure. So this, this free-for-all, less optimization, is somewhat safer. Um, there are lots of debates about this. Uh, a good debate is the NSA uh, metadata debate that's, that's been going on, and now even more, more, more maybe apropos is, should it be possible, should we make it legal or not, for messaging companies to use end-to-end -end encryption on their devices, thereby precluding courts from issuing a uh, probable cause search warrant. So in authoritarian countries, they certainly wouldn't be legal. In the US and Western history, history, they've typically said that the right to search with probable cause is valid societal thing. The tech industry doesn't want that. Apple, uh, presumably Google, I know less about it, uh, really want, and Facebook with WhatsApp, uh, really wants end-to-end -end encryption with no right to search and seizure. So these are the kinds of issues uh, that come up. Uh, these are very complicated technical problems. So many of you are machine learning researchers and statistics researchers. I won't spend time on this. I'm actually not a researcher in this domain, so I'm not that deep on these issues. But 
We don't really understand what's happening in these systems. Sometimes they work better than we think they should work. Um, we don't really understand how to generate distributions of results. So statisticians, the machine learning systems, machine learning people don't know much statistics. They say, well, this seems to work better on average. They don't really know the distribution of results. Think about it from the point of view of an investment manager. I really worry about distributions. It's great to have a good result at the end of a year. People don't <coughs> like to lose 20% of their money on any given day. So we oftentimes find it hard to use machine learning systems. Google did not use machine learning in search very much for years because it couldn't prevent occasional horrible outcomes. And they might only be 0.0001% of the searches, but if that number of searches resulted in something that was just horrific and objectionable, it was deemed by the search people at Google to be too terrible to the reputation of a company that was dedicated to quality. Um, Systems don't learn quickly, they have a lot of training time, latency of prediction can be high, um, and the scale is still very large, right, for many things and getting bigger. So those are technical challenges. You've seen this one. This came out just before my talk. I was so pleased that this example came out. Um, and that is that uh, you, we clearly have issues with adversarial networks in these systems. So it, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to confuse a system, even today, and to convince it that the system believes that that particular picture is a school bus. And not only is it likely to be a school bus, it thinks it's 99.9% .9 certain that it's a school bus. So you might say, well, this doesn't normally happen. You have to confuse systems. Well, there's a lot of people that want to confuse systems. Um, it, it may be for ill or it may not be for ill. But even in my world, is it the case that an investment management firm, if we were looking at signals from stock prices, would people want to confuse us and have us make bad investment decisions? Would that even be legal? I don't know, but it wouldn't be detectable today, probably. Um, obviously, garbage in, garbage out. Um, this is a, uh, a clear problem. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on it either in the interest of time, but if my words are that what we see going on with bias, if we learn from the present, we may imprison the future. And it's not that anyone is doing anything wrong. We're learning from the present. The, the example I would give you that I found the most interesting one is that if you build an advertising system that's trying to generate ads that will be clicked on, that will be valuable to the recipients, <coughs> you may generate ads for CEO positions in men's magazines. And that's valid in a sense. It's valid that there are more men that are up for CEO positions in society today than women. That may not be good, but it's the facts. So that system will innately bias the advertising placements to men's magazines, you know, hunting and whatever. And is that actually good for society? But it's the present imprisoning the future. Um, ownership and liability, who owns the data? So this has become a big topic today. People call it privacy. Again, I urge you not to think of it that way. This is really about data ownership. So you may contribute to the spelling correction of Google in some mean, minute way when you misspell something and correct it. Should you own the economic value of that or not? Should you own the economic value of you go to some uh, store and you click on uh, a link for some new consumer product Maybe the aggregation of all of that data is going to an investment firm which is trying to predict the success of the company producing that data. Should you gain in the value of that prediction or not? These are the kinds of issues with respect to ownership and they're complex. They occur also in self-driving cars and liability. There are a lot of, lot of history on this in the biomedical sphere to look at, etc. Explanation. Um, when I joined Google in 7 or 8, and there were all these machine learning people, they were way more than at IBM, and even we had a lot at IBM, it was extremely frustrating. Because I had come out of a classical AI background, and I wanted to say, you're not really intelligent if you can't explain why. And they could never explain why. And they would say, nice guy, you know, very nice Alfred, good question, and they went back to doing what they were doing, and they ignored me completely. They're not ignoring me anymore. This is now a very big topic. I bet some of you are working in interpretability of machine learning models and explanation now. But it's a very big topic. 
and there's so many examples. In, in the transcript of this, I go through this with a longer version of the talk. There are many more details spelled out from these charts, but um, just as an, I'll give you two examples. One is, um, if you were interested in, in these automated profiling systems that are determining whether someone should get out for parole or not, um, wouldn't you want, if you were a parolee and you were told to go back to jail, wouldn't you want to ask why? In fact, I think it's a valid question. Even if they're better, and I don't know that they're biased, there are different definitions of this, but even if they're better and unbiased, I wonder whether society should allow a judge to not have an answer to why. It's a very interesting question. And the reason why I think it's, it's not just obvious is that the judge would be able to answer why, but it might not be the real reason. We give up all sorts of validations for our actions, and we don't know that they're the real validations. They might be convenient. Right? Like, I'm leaving at 2 o'clock for a plane today. Maybe it's because I'm afraid there'll be a lot of traffic on some Los Angeles highway, or maybe I feel I'll be tired and you know, I should relax now after a, couple of, a busy week. I'll tell you it's because of the traffic, because it sounds better, but I can't be 100% certain that I wasn't a little bit lazy earlier. I don't know. Um, replicability. Um, in science, which a lot of us care about this for, we would like to have replicatable results. How do we produce the data? One of the big issues as head of research at Google was we could produce lots of beautiful results, but they were based on the Google search log or things. We couldn't publish them in ways that were good, or we'd say, just trust us. <laughs> and it's not great. It's a big problem. So this is a big issue as well, and there are many challenges. You might say, well, you know, why not anonymize the data? First, it's essentially impossible, and it's extremely easy to make mistakes. And the second is that oftentimes, um, when people try to replicate the data, they don't understand what the data is. The data is so large and complicated, it's really unclear. So think about, just as an example, let's imagine we were looking at trying to do studies on the spread of the coronavirus in China. What's the definition of having the disease kept changing? Right? What percentage of the disease is actually found, because people are asymptomatic? Uh, what, um, uh, was it actually just um, uh, the phenotype or actually having to have the virus, et cetera, et cetera? It looked like for a time you could see a, you know, a leveling off of the curve, but is that maybe, maybe they weren't measuring things, and they weren't measuring them the same way in different cities. So it's extremely difficult. My view when I was asked what did I think was happening is there's no way to know. I think there's just no way to know what's occurring. Causation. Uh, look, Plato wrote about this. This is why I think philosophy should be a part of this discussion, um, also in, in the discussion of free will, which will come up soon. Um, it's really hard. Everyone would love to do machine learning in medicine, data science in medicine, but causation is so complicated in the human body. We thought with, um, with uh, ge genetics, we'd have, you know, 20 years ago, we would be way ahead of where we are now. But it's not the sole cause of, of so many things. So it's a very hard problem to, to do this as well. So uh, a very important area, all the work going on in causality and statistics is just fantastic. So keep it up. Um, associated with this issue of data, people are, should be worried about what is the impact on free will. So who's a parent of young children in the room? Uh, any of you worried that computer games are there to distract your children and keep them from doing their homework the next day for school? I was worried about that, and we never even bought a game console because I refused to do it. Um, clearly, the systems are using the data that they're getting about kids to try to convince the kids to play more. In fact, just look, my team that worked on YouTube recommendations, their goal was to maximize YouTube watch time. Now, I didn't view that as bad. People were clicking on the results. We gave them results they would like. But I bet almost every one of us has spent an hour more time than we wished we had clicking on things. They were educational, but we had other stuff to get done. Uh, what's going on with this? Uh, is, do we are we losing free will? And this is a very hard problem. You could say ban this, ban recommendations, but that's silly. right? That doesn't make sense. My dad was a pharmacist. I would not have gone to college 
if he hadn't sold people that came in for prescriptions, hair shampoo or chocolate or something, that was how we made money. So he did, he was a recommendation system, but it did seem pretty fair, right? He was knowledgeable and loved. Maybe these big systems know too much about us. So we have to think about how we're going to deal with this behavioral targeting. You know, as another example, I mean, we'll get to it, but the Chinese are doing a huge amount of this in an attempt to shape society. It doesn't go over well in this country. On the other hand, um, we do have some belief in the book Nudge to try to nudge people to maybe not smoke, which is another use of this on the other side. Um, this is just a broad topic on, on data. No one understands the scale of data. Uh, this is nothing about, about causality or anything. It's just you can tell people a few data statistics, and they believe it's hugely impactful or not important, and they have no idea. And we don't in this room. So if you look at like the airbag issues that Takeda engendered by some bad engineering on their airbags, it drove their company out of business, perhaps rightfully. But the number of deaths is about 10. Something like that in the United States. I think it's similar in Japan. So 10 deaths out of 25 or 35,000 per year on the roads, the airbags had a far better impact on everyone than in terms of life saved than the corner of it they cut. And they might have been valid on that, but there was never a discussion in society about any of the balance on this topic, uh, on this. People don't understand data. When I was at, um, at Google, Alon Halevi, who's a very well-known database fellow, and I were very big on providing statistical data to journalists so that they could write better stories. What we've learned is that it backfired. They write worse stories. <laughs> And what's happened is, if you're a journalist, you have a point of view. I'm going to write about Takeda. Now you can get the data on every death. And you're going to have a really likely ability to absolutely destroy the company, if you wish. Because you can, you can do everyone death. You don't have to publish all the times that wheels fell off of cars. or all the. You can publish whatever you want. So people can selectively get whatever data they want. And the public has no ability to interpret it. And if you are, so I know your sister school at Berkeley is teaching DS8. I think that's a really important part of the curriculum, to go try to teach our students to be more sensible about this. That would be broader than just this school of computing and information science. What's that's DSA? everyone in the... What's DS8? What is DSA? D DS8 is a course in um, data science for the masses. It's sort of, instead of teaching everyone introductory computing, it's computing and statistics and data science that I think people at Berkeley would kind of like everyone to take at the university. I don't know if they're doing that yet, but I think that's kind of the goal. It's viewed as like they should, people should know algebra. Makes sense to me. And finally, there's this issue of what are the, the final of the 10, what are the issue of objective functions? What, what do we want to go do? So it's, it's pretty easy if you're looking to um, sort of easy to do revenue maximization in an advertising system, but it's very hard in many zero-sum games uh, where it's trickier. So uh, there are many tragedy of the commons phenomenon, and even things which seem obvious aren't. It would have seemed obvious that minimizing traffic delays in a mapping system was a good thing. However, if you are, are on a side road off of one of the uh, interstate highways, one, one of your um, freeways here in California, and all of the traffic is being routed by your house. Yes, it's probably lowering carbon dioxide emissions and saving time, and your property is not as valuable as it used to be. And you're kind of annoyed sitting out of your swimming pool that all these cars are coming by, and this has happened. Uh, we have the ability to play God. That's what the Chinese are doing. I brought this up earlier. With their recommendation systems and tracking, they believe they can generate coherence in society that's sadly lacking in uh, the United States or in, uh, in England or something like that. And they can nudge and predict and generate, uh, generate some consistency of views. Um, I think they would, it would be an interesting debate. I don't like it because I'm a pluralist that believes in complete freedom of speech and that it's safer long term. 
but I'm not sure I would win the debate. I might win the debate here in, in Irvine. I don't know that I would win the debate in Beijing. So can we, as a pluralistic democratic society, deal with highly quantified trade-offs? And quantified trade-offs may be harder to deal with than the abstract, less quantified trade-offs that we had before. I won't have time to go into why that is, but you could just imagine that in a school district, if you had the choice of intervening for, say, academically talented students versus literacy, and you could quantify the difference, you could get real big fights at school boards, where before you just said, look, we'll just split the difference. Um, uh, I added this just yesterday for this talk. I forgot about how long the talk is. Um, think about the following set of trade-offs as an example of some of these things. So uh, COVID has an incubation period of some number of days before you have any symptoms. Uh, because of that, it's actually very difficult to know how to deal with the spread of the disease. Our cell phones are generally with us, and they know where we've been. Um, not perfectly, but, but rather well. Should we be requiring in society that as the, if an outbreak gets near, that we have an app loaded on our phone by the Center for Disease Control or the World Health Organization, which will flash red if we have been too close in the graph structure to someone who has the disease. Think of all the privacy implications, uh, very large. Uh, security implications even might exist in this. On the other hand, it could really reduce the spread of the disease. I published this as a thought experiment just a few days ago, and I think it's a very good thought experiment for you to consider. By the way, if you're systems people like, like, like I am, it's a really interesting problem domain to think about how to do this as well as possible. And you really can do very well with minimizing privacy uh, issues, but you can't eliminate them completely. Anyway, there's a, if you search for that topic, uh, thought experiments, coronavirus and tracing contacts, you can find an eight paragraph little essay on this thought experiment. So far I have not been arrested by anyone on either the privacy community or the CDC. Last topic, of uh, the last of the 11, uh, Michael Young wrote a book called The Rise of Meritocracy. He's a British sociologist in the 1950s. And he invented the term meritocracy. Interesting enough, it's not an old word. I don't know if any of you knew that, but it's, it's a new word. And he actually did not think meritocracy was perfect. We all sort of think of it as perfect. We want a meritocracy. Everyone should get every possible opportunity and then we have a meritocracy. And then you know, whoever can do well does well, and that, as long as it's fair. So imagine meritocracy if all of us were farmers without much equipment. So some of you are a bit younger, and you'd be producing twice as much food as I do. And you know, maybe I'm a little younger than some. Maybe I'd be producing 10% more than somebody else in the room. We would be within a factor of two or four of each other. Now, witness data science and technology. Those of us that are good at it and well-educated could achieve a hundred, a thousand, or a million times more than someone else. Witness the person who ever figures out how to, or the company that figures out how to do self-driving trucks, as an example. So what we are doing with all this technology, and particularly with data science, I think, because it's so powerful, is we are increasing, in electrical engineering terms, the gain on merit. So merit's always been, merit is defined by, by Young as innate ability and educational background that enables you to, nature and nurture, okay, which is a reasonable, reasonable definition. We don't know the ratios, but some combination of the two. Um, he, he, he would say that he's worried about a world where the gain on merit is too great, particularly in uh, a democracy where people can be very concerned about this, as we see today. I think it's a very interesting question of whether we are contributing to this. So what do we do about it all? So first, um, recognize the stakes have changed. So 10 to 20 years ago, we all looked for proof points. Could this work? We've got them. And now, with years of geometric growth in it, um, there's motivation for well-funded manipulators. Uh, we're contributing to social fragmentation. And there are a lot of domain-specific problems, right? like in you know, worrying about 
facial recognition and doorbells and all sorts of things like that. So I think it's clear that the era of cute and cuddly is over. Um, and there, there are just many examples of that. Um, on the other hand, I was, at a, I was at a meeting over the weekend of sort of policy types and members of parliament and other politicians in England. No one there, even, even organized socialist labor, doesn't believe we should be Luddites. It was very interesting. At least at that meeting, the representatives of the outgoing labor party were not in favor of restriction of all technology, which is good. They said, we just can't do it. There's too much that's going on. Plus, I believe you can't ban technology anyway because you, you just can't ban it because it's going to happen someplace else if you ban it. So um, at our conference, there was no disagreement that you can't be conservative and try to repress. But on the other hand, these societal concerns are real. So at, at that conference, everybody is concerned about wealth and economic security given these technologies that we're building. At the individual level, intergenerationally, interclass, which is a word they use in England more than we do, regionally, um, the little towns and villages versus the cities, across countries and across political systems. So this divide occurs in many different levels. We used to always say, we were very proud of this, I bet Mike and Rich and I, we felt the internet was above country. We did it better, we didn't need the politicians, and we, we built this system which worked everywhere. And the politicians don't like it anymore because it's now important. It wasn't important when Rich and I would send an email message about a typo in my thesis, the politicians didn't care. <laughs> but they care now. Um, there are notions of manipulation that are real. Individual freedom is considered as whether this is impacting that based on the <coughs> kinds of things I mentioned. Um, errors in their impact due to causality and garbage. Uh, and we, we have the ability to do things we've never done before, and that scares people. So, Here's what I think. So first is we have terrible vocabulary. So I think we need to have a set of definitions that occur not just in a you know, technical journal, not just in a, in a theory journal, but about what we mean by privacy and prosperity and wealth effects and influence. What do these things mean? And if we could write them down, we could have actual good debates on this. We could have reasonable debates on the subject as opposed to what happens now is that even when I'm involved in the debate, they usually descend into nothingness because people are talking about different subjects. We have a lot of work to do in research, so you guys have a big part in that. So these are just some of the topics, but there, there are many. We should include science fiction authors, by the way. Um, there's a lot of, these people have been really effective in this. Um, in finance, there are really interesting questions about market stability, how will all this play out? No one really knows some of it, so it's a lot to do in many domains. Um, there's societal questions. How do we build consensus? Um, we didn't believe there was any international body that could run the internet because the Chinese view and the American view of the internet or the Russian view was completely different. So how do we build organizations, institutions that can build consensus in this domain? And I don't think we want a world where we just segregate the internet between quote free societies and not. And even that may not work. We see this rise of nationalism that could even separate societies that are more alike than different. And that seems to me to be problematic. But there are lots of topics around this that need to be done. One thing I think clearly is the case is we should learn from, from many areas of history when technology revolutions really had an impact on lots of people. And that was initially, say, uh, mechanization of weaving in the early 1800s, which displaced hundreds of thousands of people in Ireland and the UK and generated gigantic migrations across the ocean here to this country. Uh, and in the coal mines, which you saw having a huge effect on elections in the United States. And in, so everyone that was like talking about how evil coal was wasn't doing anything to the people that depended on the coal economy. And it's not surprising that they had a point of view that was anti-global warming and anti-liberal in both countries and in favor of Brexit in the case of the UK. So we need to do a lot to uh, smooth the hump. That's a big role for education over the long term. And then the employment cross currents are very interesting. We're having a decline in the number of the, the population of people that are, that are working age. Uh, on the other hand, there are also declines in the retail sector but gain, gains in healthcare. Have to think about regulation, um, and look, there's 
two roles here in the university. One is you provide a tool for almost all departments, right? You, you are a key tool for the way the university can work in the future, but also the field of data science is a field, I think, to which many departments must contribute themselves. Because I think we can't do this without thinking about free will, and it isn't just those of us in the computer science and statistics department that are going to understand what's acceptable from a free will perspective. Uh, those of you that care about uh, online games, this is a uh, political advertisement, not a political advertisement, there's no money in this for us. We just like to encourage people to think algorithmically and to come up with ways, maybe even to use reinforcement learning in a really interesting game that we produced. And it'll be announced in early March, but if you search for um, halite.io or halite and Kaggle, I'm sure if you register something in your search engine, it will tell you about this in the next couple of weeks when we get it out. So um, I don't think there's too much time, but uh, that's kind of what I've talked about. I could try to take a few questions if that's OK. It's so broad a topic, it's often hard to come up with a question because like, you have to like delve into some absolute detail uh, to get it. But um, You never showed us a slide from Turing on learning. Oh yeah, I didn't show you. Well, so Turing did, so I said the field was mostly, it's, it was out of order. It's too easy to out of, make slides out of order in Google Slides. It's an error in the system. It's an HCI error you should fix. Um, the, uh, so Turing, I think if you look at his contributions to the world, there were four. So first he was a war hero, right? He really did have a fundamental impact on <coughs> the Battle of Britain in the air uh, and the naval battles, um, getting supplies to England. Second, he, he's really the god of computability theory, right? He figured out Turing machines. To me, that as a computer scientist, that was the key thing he did. He was a bit of an engineer. So he did develop some modern ideas, a few, not as much as others of his era that actually did stick around in computing. <coughs> and fourth, he's known for the Turing test, but he had just a few ideas in, in artificial intelligence, and, and I don't think his contributions were as strong there, but he did write in that document I almost showed you that he did begin to hypothesize that you could win, you could learn to play games in the same way that AlphaGo uh, learned to play uh, Go. So he did mention that, and then Samuels, back in like 1959, I think, something like that, actually did work on that with checkers. So there's a little bit of empiricism that early, but the empiricism in the field was so small then, in comparison today, when maybe, I bet your students now here are, your students are 80% interested in machine learning and 20% interested in the rest, or 60-40 or something. So it's changed completely. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, you had the slide on that mentioned privacy, security, resilience. Yes. And um, an interesting aspect is that techniques to solve one are often at odds with techniques to solve the other. And, yeah, it's true. Right? So if you want to hide the data, how do you make your decisions more resilient? Right. And um, so, you know, what role do you think data science has to play in addressing this kind of conflict? <coughs> So I think this field is kind of um, filled with a lot of nuance. Um, it's, it's so easy to build a system that does something and proves something. It's so hard to make a system that works well. And it's never going to, nothing is perfect, right? We're in the world of mankind. It's, nothing is perfect. So I think the, 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 the design of these things that balances these issues is where it's at. So, the reason why I'm, I mean, the only reason I'm at all possibly still a computer scientist is I'm quite thoughtful at this point. So as you build things, I do see many of the different aspects of how things fit together. And that's very important. Those of you that are aspiring young computer scientists, think really carefully about all the balance points that you have to look at in building a good system. Don't just think in terms of, well, this will do a better job on that. Look at everything else where it may cause problems. And I, I think that's all I can say. I don't, I don't see another solution. Yeah, in the back. Do you have, in your company or 
anyplace else some sort of algorithm that would establish or look at or investigate the ethical constructs of the people you hire? It seems to me that the people who design these systems uh, ought to have some sort of qualification in terms of their balance. Do you do that when you hire people? Uh, well, our motto is nice geeks. <laughs> nice geeks. Nice uh, geeks want to get rich sometimes. Uh, I don't have a problem with people wanting to get rich. That seems okay to me. Um, I, I certainly don't have a problem with that. I, I would have. I would not like them to get rich through illegal or immoral, unethical reasons. But I would be very glad for them to be well, very successful. Well, it seems like that the example you used with uh, CEOs appearing in men's magazines would be a relatively easy thing to well, to but fix. so the answer is it was not known. I mean, as soon as it was known, it was fixed. Uh, but if you gave engineers the goal of maximizing click rates, they didn't think about that. And I don't think you would have either. I, I would never have seen it. So it was not possible to foresee that in advance. So, and by the way, it's, look, for all, and, and I'll say, I, I think, frankly, if you look at all of the issues in publications and periodicals in the world at large, we're not talking about a war crime of the hugest proportions, and I say with this due respect to women as well. Um, this is something that one noticed was fixed. Uh, I don't think you could screen for someone that could find that problem in advance. But I do think we all do need, uh, what I would say to you though, I do endorse this. I think as engineers, we all have to be respectful of the power of the technologies which are at our disposal. However, the other side of that is you have to be thoughtful about it. So an example is, uh, and you can reach your own conclusion, many Google employees really disagreed with Google's decision to be involved with using machine learning in, I think, the targeting of drones, or at least that's what you see in the popular press, is after my time. So the question is, should they, is it ethical for them to try to use civil disobedience mechanisms to prevent their company from doing that? Uh, I think the answer is complicated, right? I, I would not have done that. I would certainly recommend that anyone who does it be, is prepared to lose their job. So if you believe strongly enough, just like with any act of civil disobedience, you have to plan on losing your job if you do it. So I don't think that this is like, a, every company can't be a complete democracy around the ethical views of every individual on subjects which are quite complex in nature. So it's a really interesting issue. You'll see this play out. And I can't give you the complete answers. As someone who's been on both sides of these things, as you can tell, I'm characteristically wishy-washy. <laughs> all right, last question, I think, and then I'll, I'll take it from, because I think we're out of time and you all probably have other things to do. Yes? Yeah, thanks. So you said machine learning models are 10% better than heuristics. Well, they, so they always were traditionally in what we did, yes, sure. at least. So at least. solutions to your love and challenges already existed before the data science era. So do we need solutions that are just 10% better, or do we need some fundamental new solutions? Well, I mean, look, if you think about the one I gave you about C CEOs, I'm sure there was an editor-in-chief of, in some, in some advertising agency that didn't put CEO ads in women's magazines in the 1950s. So we probably were doing better. So the, the answer is we have to do well, right? The answer is that, you know, you, that 10% number is just like it always worked, and it did uh, historically. But we have to do better than just get a small improvement. We have to think through the consequences. And I, I want you to know, I do think, so I, I know, you know, when I joined Google, everyone said, I love Google. Today, that's not as true. I think the very big and good and small tech companies, most of them actually are made up of people, probably like us in this room, that are trying to thread the needle and do this right. Um, and it's hard. I mean, just imagine the, the debate on if you were Facebook, on whether you want or don't want to have um, access to the message traffic of people. On the one hand, if you don't have access to the message traffic, you're sacrosanct, right? You didn't see anything. You had no way of preventing some problem. On the other hand, if you don't see it, you're not doing anything good for the world, but you're getting out of, you're, quote, staying out of political debates. If you know the answer to that, I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg would like to know. <laughs> and there are many more. I mean, how many of you do computer architecture? Secure enclaves are an amazing idea that Intel and AMD and others are doing to prevent <coughs> cloud um, 
systems from having access to the data of the computations going on on the cloud. They'll be completely and cryptographically secure for all practical purposes. Very, very difficult to break. That means that cloud companies can contribute to malfeasance in society without even knowing they're doing it. Think about the balance of that. Is it good or bad? All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir.